Welcome to Excel and Finance video number 20. Hey, if you want to download this workbook or the PDFs, just click on the link below the video. This is chapter 3, so you can download the chapter 3 workbook and PDFs. Hey, we have just a few more ratios to talk about. We want to talk about the internal growth rate. Uh, the sustainable growth rate, and then a few other uh, market value ratios. Now, the internal growth rate is the maximum that the corp can the corporation can achieve in growth with no external financing, no issuing debt or equity. We take ROA times B. What's B? Oh, B. We saw this when we did our income statements last chapter, chapter 2, addition to retain earnings. That just means if we have net income, we pay some out as dividends and the rest we plow back into the company. So this is, in essence, internal financing. So the way we calculate this B is addition to retain earnings divided by net income. Right? If it's all going back, all net income, no dividends are being paid out, then this is 1. Right? So we do that. This is for internal if we're not going to get any external financing. The sustainable growth rate, this means you're not going to get this calculation. You're not going to get any external financing except to maintain a constant debt to equity ratio. Now, if you have you know good ideas and you're expanding a lot, then of course you want to go out and get debt or equity. Uh, finally, we're going to look at the price to earnings ratio, simply the price per share. And you go out and you can see that in the for publicly traded companies. And you divide it by earnings per share. Earnings per share just says, hey, all the net income ava available for or earned for this particular period divided by the number of shares. Earnings per share says if we gave all the profit for this period out to the stockholders, how much would each one get? So I make this calculation, and this is called the P-E ratio, and it's a surrogate for growth. Um, people interpret a high P-E ratio as the market's thinking that the stock has a lot of growth potential. Finally, we have market to book ratio. You take the price per share, that's out in the market, right? Price per share, price per share, and you divide it by equity per share. So we actually look on the balance sheet and figure out the total equity, divide it by the number of shares, and get what the book value per share would be. So this is for one share, the book value, and this is the market value per one share. When we do that division, if we get a number greater than one, it means the financial markets think the corp is worth more than the book value. And that's just m mostly the case, most often the case. Not, not always, but. Uh, and less than one means the financial markets think the corp is worth less, the corporation is worth less than the book value. Uh, let's go over to Excel. All right, here's our uh, workbook, and we're on the growth market ratio. So growth and then market ratio sheet. Um, here we have our net income for 2006. We have a few numbers that we've been working with throughout this whole chapter. Dividends paid in 2006, book value of equity in 2006. Here's our return for on assets. We calculated that last video. Return on equity. And there's our B. This is simply, uh, if we go over here and look, This is 2005 calculation, so right here. Here's our net income. Here's the dividend, so the calculation for amount we get to plow back into the company. Hey, our net income minus our dividends. Now that's sitting in cell C17, so I went ahead and uh, calculated this. That amount, you can see the blue box right there, divided by the income. Now this is the internal growth weight if we're not going to issue any debt or equity. So in parentheses, we're going to say, actually, we don't have to, equals the ROA, return on assets, times our B. And then we're going to divide it by 1 minus that same thing, return on assets times B. 
4.52. Now, if we're going to uh, keep a constant debt to equity ratio, which some firms like to do, it's the same calculation except for we're going to be doing, instead of return on assets, return on equity equals, oh, return on equity times that B divided by in parentheses 1 minus return on equity times the B, close parentheses. So uh, those are the, that's the internal growth rate, sustainable growth rate. We now want to look at some those market values. Now here we went out, this is all for 2006. Our financial statements were ending on September 26 or something like that. Oh, September 24th and in 2006. So I went out and got the number of shares from Yahoo Finance or Google Finance or one of those. And we got our market value of stock. Now this is 2006. I'm shooting this video in 2010. Um, stock prices come down quite a bit. And you, you got to expect that, right? What does Whole Foods do? They sell high-end goods. Um, at least according to the perception of customers, they're high-end goods. They actually do a pretty good job of keeping prices low for organic and natural items. And they do it because they have the economies of scale. They are the biggest chain that sells that kind of uh, food. All right, so let's do our earnings per share. Okay, we got this from, you know, the markets that. So we go up and we get equals our net income for 2006 divided by earnings per share. So this is, if we were going to pay out all of, did I get, yeah, net income, boop, each stockholder would get $1.46. Now the surrogate for growth, our P-E ratio, we say equals whatever the price is divided by this earnings per share. Wow, that's huge, 40. So in 2006, the markets absolutely had, uh, a, they believed that Whole Foods was expanding. And if you looked at their financial statements, read their um, the notes in the financial statements, read their blogs at their website, read their manager statements. They, they were, and they, they were expanding a lot. When the financial crisis hit, you know, they had to stop some of that, um, and people bought less of the high-end items. So this was, this was high back in 2006, but maybe somewhat justified. They were expanding. Now, dividends per share, that's just a straight calculation. We need to know what the dividends are. So dividends divided by our number of outstanding shares. That tells you the cash that each stockholder got this year, $2.56. Finally, our last ratio we're going to look at is market to book. And if we know the market value of the stock and the book value of the stock, we do this ratio. And if it's bigger, that means the markets are valuing the company more than the actual a company is on the book. So let's go ahead and do it. There's our stock price. That's the uh, stock price for one stock divided by, and now we're going to have to do a calculation because we don't have book value per stock, but no problem. We take our equity divided by, in parentheses, our uh, shares outstanding. And so 5.8 nine. That means that for every one dollar of book value, there's five dollars and eighty-nine cents of a market value. L let's look at some of these numbers in comparison. This sheet over here, there's industry averages and uh, more industry. Let's look at industry average. Again, this is back in 2006. Price to earning for grocery stores in this industry were 17. Wow, look at that. Again, if price for earnings is a surrogate for growth, the markets absolutely thought that Whole Foods was going to expand a lot faster than Safeway. And it was. There were in the aughts, 2000 to 2006, the demand for organic and natural foods was increasing dramatically. And in fact, Safeway and uh, Walmart and Fred Myers and QFC and many other uh, 
um, food chains were trying to catch up, right? Because they saw that the demand was increasing. So, uh, and let's see, a price to book, not much difference. Profit margin, you expect this. I have a percentage format here. If I click here and go and then increase the decimal, you can see it in percentage, right? But that's to be expected because they ha sell high end. The, um, grocery chains are usually low profit margin, high turnover. They go through, they sell a lot, sell a lot. But um, you expect that this high end uh, Whole Foods would have a higher profit margin, and they do. Return on equity, just a little bit higher. And look at this. So remember when we looked at the DuPont analysis, you can uh, increase return on equity when you have more debt, or if you can meet your debt payments, of course. So this is lower than for the industry. The return on equity is lower than it is for Whole Foods. But in part, they increase this. So this would be even lower if they had the same debt equity to ratio as Whole Foods. So Whole Foods is uh, getting a good return on equity with not so much debt. They, the less debt you have, the less chance you have of going uh, defaulting on debt and getting into trouble. All right, now these are averages. And um, the, that is very useful. But sometimes you, you don't want to look at averages. You want to look at a, a little bit more data. Now, an average says what's in the middle. This is the middle value. You, you look at all of the numbers for the industry, you add them up, divide by the count. But we also sometimes can look at what are called quartiles. Let's go over here, and the, our textbook talks about this. Uh, median is the one in the middle. So PE ratio 17.4. Um, so I got 17.5, a little, a little bit different rounding here. But that's the one in the middle. Median means you line them all out, and actually the one that is positionally in the middle, it's a type of average. Quartile, well, what does a median mean? It means that 50% of the values are below and 50% of the values are above. I did, I did the motion wrong. This is below, this is above. But this one, when you say lowest quartile, it means 25% of the values are below and 75 above. The highest quartile, the third, says 25% above, 75% below. So it's in essence we're getting a range of values we can look at, right? So the lowest quartile uh, that's 15.3, the one in the middle is 17, and the highest amongst all of the the grocers and people who sell food is 20. You can see for PE we are way above the highest quartile. Here, return on equity, we're in between the middle and the highest quartile. So that means there's some people in this industry that are earning, you know, more than our 14.5 percent or our decimal. Long-term equity, yeah, we're way down here. We're in the lowest or near the lowest quartile, which, you know, when you leverage up, you can buy more assets, and if you have a good idea, that can be good. But uh, the more debt you have, the more risk you have. Part of the reason, you know, Whole Foods could have really had big trouble in the, when the financial crisis hit, because they're selling high-end items. And what do people do when they're in a recession? They don't buy high-end items, but they didn't have a a lot of uh, a debt, at least not in 2006, which probably helped them a lot. You know, remember what happened in the financial crisis? Uh, some of the uh, some big retailers went bankrupt, and it was because they had too much debt. All right, so when people stop buying things and you have a lot of debt, you can't meet your interest payments and you're in big trouble. Price to earnings, uh, yeah, we're way above. That's similar to this, right? Price to earnings, so the market is valuing them very highly. And then finally, net profit margin, oh, look at this. We're Whole, Whole Foods is way above, and you would expect that because they're a high end. Uh, seller. All right, um, that's it for chapter three. Uh, chapter four and five comes up next, and then we'll start there to start talking about cash flows and actually making a, an investment like into a bank account with an interest rate and figure out what the value of that investment will be. All right, see you next chapter.